So I'm going to share with you a little bit about our next speaker. Most of you know this, but I just want, for those that don't, let me just break it down. Minister Kevin and Deidre Ewing have been married for the past seven years and blessed with four lovely children, Garrett, Kevin Jr., Kia, and Christina. Minister Kevin Ewing is well known locally throughout his native home, the Bahamas, and internationally for his detailed religious teachings. He has been a guest on many local and international radio talk shows and a guest speaker at many local and international conferences, workshops, and revivals, specifically for his teachings on spiritual warfare and dream interpretation. He has a weekly radio show called The Spiritual Insight Show. Many of us have probably watched it a, a, a few times. If you haven't, you should check it out. Many tune in via social media to watch and listen to his wisdom and knowledge of the scriptures. His teachings are saturated with scriptures, and he believes that the Holy Scriptures are the constitution for humanity and, by extension, creation. He is also the administrator, producer, and writer for his blog site, Journey Into God's Word, with a successful YouTube channel with over 200,000 subscribers. So ladies and gentlemen, I suggest that you get your pens and pads. I suggest you prepare your, your hearts and minds to receive what this man of God has to share. And it is my pleasure to bring forward my friend, mentor, Mr. Kevin L.A. Ewing. Anyway, listen, it is a pleasure to mount this pulpit. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, uh, Tracy and Lou, for this awesome uh, invitation. Uh, our time has been excellent, especially being among all of the other couples. Uh, yesterday uh, was riveting. It's my word, riveting. <laughs> no, cost me get all educated over here. <laughs> anyway, it was very, very riveting. And like Deidre would have said, you guys had my full attention. And let me tell you the real reason why. Outside of the, the contents, which was so rich, you were you. you. You weren't trying to put on an alcohol super smart and, you know, that Queen's English and all that stuff. And when I see that, I'm attracted to that. I love real people. I love people who've been through the struggle, who know about the other side of life, now that God has blessed them with this side of life. See, they're the people I want to talk to. You see, I don't want to talk to no fellow who's been to school for 400 years. He never had no struggle in his life. His family took care of him all his life. He can't help me. No, all he can do is feed me fantasies. I don't need to be talking to him. So, so I was very much elated by uh, you guys yesterday, by the Taylors. And it was very, very encouraging. See, one like me, I love learning. I love it. And I can learn from anybody. It doesn't matter. You know, uh, when I look at how God used me, who uh, I, I never finished college. I, I did a little bit of it. I did Bible study. I mean, Bible college. Uh, but even in that, in Bible college, I left, and the reason why I left because these guys started talking some stuff that it, I just this wasn't what I was reading in the Bible. So for me, I just couldn't play along, and I'm a realist. I cannot play along and fake and do all that other foolishness. That's that's not me. But besides all of that, again, you know, I, I really want to thank you guys, Tracy and Lou, for this awesome invitation and having the opportunity, my wife and I, to come there and really share with you guys. Now today for me is going to be very surgical. Oh yeah, very surgical. And they normally bring me in when they want to do neurosurgery. They bring me in. <laughs> okay, they bring me in. And of course, like DJ would have mentioned earlier, you know, our topics was what is lacking in a marriage today, what are the challenges and how to oh, make... Oh, okay, can you hear me now? Okay. Okay. There we go. All right, that's better? Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. Right. So you won't miss none of this. Some hot stuff. <laughs> Some hot stuff, trust me. No, 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 not a word, not a word. In fact, you can need two plates for this one. <laughs> okay. Anyway, like I said, Deidre, we said it earlier, our topic was what is lacking in a marriage today, 
what are the challenges and how to make marriages work? Now, Deidre gave you the nice stuff, but I have to go in. All right, I have to yeah. go in and really remove this cancer so this poison can be cancer free. All right? Now, marriage, I want you to hear this. Every marriage is likened to a kingdom, which is consistent with a king being the husband and a queen being the wife. However, however, this kingdom was initiated by the ultimate, which is the kingdom of God, all right? In political terms, this is referred to as a quasi-government. A quasi-government is a government within a government. For example, back home where I live, it is the only island in the Bahamas that has a government in it outside of the government of the Bahamas. It's called the Port Authority. However, a quasi-government is a government that is supported by the national government, but it's privately run. So what a marriage is, a marriage is where Deidre and I are the king and queens of our little kingdom, but we are subject to the ultimate government, which is the government of God. And that's how every marriage ought to be. In other words, the rules and regulations that's going to dictate to this kingdom must come from a higher power. So folks are already in error when their little kingdom or their marriage does not submit to the rules to the kingdom of God. Now, why am I saying all of this? Because everything is run by a rule, a law, a principle. I said uh, yesterday how much I love, uh, in school, I loved uh, science. In fact, I used to master in biology, geography, physics, chemistry. I loved those stuff. In fact, I even considered being a chemist at one point. And the reason why I didn't really pursue that because I was like kind of limited, you know? Next thing you know, I'm making cocaine and stuff. No, no. <laughs> 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 no, so that, that wasn't my field. <clears throat> but what I learned in life, but became more clear to me as I got older, rules. That, that always, I don't know, spoke to me. And I remember when I uh, started my physics class, I was in grade 10. And our physics teacher, he actually was an atheist. And I remember one day he had like this little, uh, it's like a little glass figurine. And he was doing a demonstration. And he took it and he threw it on the ground and it broke into many pieces. And he said, those pieces that fell wherever they went didn't go there by accident. He started talking about gravity and gravitational force, drag, all this other stuff that we were just coming into being our first time in a physics class. But that never left me because what I got from that, which made Christianity more interesting to me, was that nothing in life is happening by chance or accident. It is being governed or ruled or dominated by some principles, some rules, some ordinance. Now the advantage to the person engaging here is that their lack of it will always prove erroneous in the end because they don't know the rules. For example, there's people who do not know how to drive a car. So to them when they go to the car, they become fearful. They don't know what to do. So if they just go and do it, trust me, they're going to run into something, they're going to do something. Why? Because they lack rules. But us who are so familiar with it, we jump on it and do a regular thing. So this is where the Bible comes out. The Bible says, okay, your life is the way that it is right now in terms of its tragedies, ups and downs, or whatever, it's because you don't know the rules. And the Bible says that it is because of your lack of knowledge or the lack of the rules that is causing you to perish, to fail. Well, marriage is no different. Marriage, if you want a successful, if, let me put it this way, if you see a marriage that is failing, there are people who are ignorant to the rules. No, we don't need a college degree for this. We don't need a committee to figure this out. We don't need a board of directors. Wherever people are failing in life, inclusive of a marriage, they are failing because they are either ignorant to or in rebellion to the rules that govern that particular thing that they're failing in. Very simple. So like I said to you, your marriage is a kingdom, but that kingdom is subject to the ultimate, the kingdom of God. And why is this? Because the kingdom of God is the, is the, is the one that gave the rules to your little kingdom. But you don't want to do it that way. <laughs> you don't want to do it that way. You want to do it your way. So the success of a marriage or your private kingdom, is solely based on the constitution of 
the kingdom, which is the kingdom of God. And what is a constitution? A constitution is the ultimate laws of a country, of a society, of a body. The constitution of the United States, in fact, it was just a rule yesterday that a Roe versus Wade was abolished. So, right, that's a beautiful thing. I, I always agree to that. But the, the reality is, and this is so powerful, that even though those people who are against it, there's nothing they could do. Why? Because the Constitution says you don't have the right to kill nobody, child. Amen. Now, they could protest all they want because in this, in America, you have the right to. But you cannot overturn that Constitution. So, you see the power of the Constitution. So God's law, as we're about to get to, as it relates to marriage, is the Constitution. Now, I remember I told you, your, your marriage is a private kingdom, or it's privately run, but it must be within the Constitution. Now, you could have policies for your marriage. You could have that. That's all right. But no matter what you put there, you could have little rules. You could even have laws. But it cannot and should not exceed or trump the constitution that God has put in place. I'll give you a perfect example. And we're about to get into it as our first point. When God instituted marriage, I didn't read Adam and Steve. Did you read it? <laughs> I didn't read that. Huh? I didn't read Eve and Jane. Right. I didn't read that. So when God set out his constitution as it relates to holy matrimony, it was very clear. Male and female. Yeah. So I don't care all of this liberal right and gender this and all this. I don't listen to that nonsense. And I'm not going to refute and argue to anybody. If that's what you believe, you stare it over there. But you're not going to convince me because, oh, you know, God is love and we should love each other. And it shouldn't matter who we love. And I'm, I heard one person said the other day, said, uh, this, this gay lady, she's on television. She said, you know, I told my friends that, you know, they, they, when they love, they look at sex. I love a person. Mm, okay, you love a person, I guess they're sexless. Because no matter how you look at them, the reality, they have a you know, penis or a vagina. I mean, right. come on. That's right. Right. But here is, and I was sharing this with uh, Nicole and, and Stacy, I mean, Tracy the other night. See, the, the idea is to change the narrative, man. Yeah. We can discuss the obvious issue here. We can dance around that, tap dance, moonwalk, cabbage patch, do all that stuff, but we can never address that. And whenever they get aggressive, of course, you put laws in place now again to protect them. So now you could, I could come up to you and say, you old heterosexual. I'll never get locked up for that. Right. But if I say you gay, man, I'll come, you gay for the 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so you see, they're trying to conform you to their narratives, but at the same time trying to trump the ultimate laws as it relates to marriage and male and female. And a lot of people are buying into it, as usual, for political mileage and so on and so forth, right? A constitution is a genesis or genetics of, or, or ruling authority of laws over every, over every other law or policy of a country, body, etc. The purpose of the constitutional laws is to ultimately set order. I love it. God laws are to set order, to bring a uniform behavior. Think about it. Nothing in God's law is to bring chaos or confusion. And that's why the scriptures can boldly say that he's a God of order. He's always trying to set order through his laws. The purpose of constitutional laws is to ultimately set order or what? Structure. Same thing. Psalms 119 verse 105. I love this one. Psalms 119 verse 105. It says, thy word, which is God's law, is a lamp, what? Unto my feet and a light unto my pathway. So the word of God is the laws of God. But this is powerful because the analogy or the metaphor that he's using here is a lamp. And he's likening his word or his laws as a lamp. Why would I, would you, need a, would you need a lamp to go outside right now? No. So the only time you would need a lamp is in a dark area. So the Bible is saying, and we, of course we're discussing marriage here, he's saying that when you get married without God, or you're trying to do things in your marriage without God, you are in darkness. He said, however, it's a choice to be there. 
Because my word, which is a lamp, is to now help you and your spouse, you king and queens in your kingdom, to now how to navigate in this darkness. Some good stuff in the darkness, you know, as well as some bad stuff. However, you will never know what's really good or bad if you say, you know what, I don't need the lamp no more, which is the word of God. I'm going to do it my way. So according to scripture, you're walking in darkness, spiritually. So you're all over the place. And then amazingly, this is what really, really freaks me out. You're shocked when bad things happen to the relationship. How could this happen? Well, let me see. Did you break the laws? Oh, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> so the Bible says in Psalms 119 verse 105, it says, Thy word, which is the ultimate constitution of creation, it says, it is a lamp unto thy feet and a light unto thy pathway. That's the word of God. He says, without this, you, you, you are, in fact, it is the only ingredient that you would need for destruction, the lack of the word of God. Order, what is it? The arrangement of people or things in relation to each other according to a particular sequence, pattern, or method. And what does this mean? Okay, so God laid out these rules for marriage. What is he trying to do? Well, what he's trying to do is create an order so that if everybody operate this way, and this is what I love about God's laws, because incorporated in every law, inculcated into it, is a reward. But also a punishment. So it's a punishment if you go against the rules, but there's always a reward if you follow the rules. So God doesn't say, now, my original law is you now get a wife, and then you all follow my word, and at the end of this, I'm going to reward you every step of the way. If I'm going to bless you, when you got married before, you were broke like the Ten Commandments, you had no money, but guess what, you keep doing it my way, and I'm going to bless you abundantly. Yeah. You didn't have no idea how you're going to get your own home one day, and you could calculate now, you're going to pay a mortgage, how much you had to get up with, but if you keep following my law, I'm going to give it to you debt-free. Come on, keep coming, keep coming, I'm going to give you this. And those children, yeah, you had some generational curses where you had some deformity in the family, some medical conditions, but if you keep following my law, you will never, ever have those problems yeah. anymore. So you see where the law is a rewarder. Yes. And all of this is an incentive to keep you coming. Come on, come, don't listen to these clouds. Come over here, keep doing what I tell you to do. Amen. Then you sit back and you listen to these jokers. I don't believe Jesus is real. I don't have a problem, stay right over there in the corner. Don't come over here, <laughs> stay right over you, over there, and you're not believing Jesus. Do not come across here. Now let's look at some more scriptures to bring this together, this initial part of it, right? Let's look at Proverbs chapter 16. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. Proverbs chapter 16, verse 9. Now remember I said to you, because what we about the scriptures we're about to read now is heavily based or hinging on doing it God's way. And when you do it God's way, you will always get a God result. All right? So Proverbs 16, verse 9 says, A man's heart devised his way. Okay. But the Lord... Listen, do what? Directs a step. Now remember the analogy that I gave you. Our marriages is our little private kingdom, privately run by us. God ain't fussing you there. He is never going to challenge your free will. That's what you get to do. But now he's saying, now be in, bear in mind now, I am the ruler of not just your marriage, but all creation. Now you can have your own thoughts. I'm not going to stop you there. You can be creative. Again, you could have your policies, but they cannot trump my constitution. So God is saying, okay, a man divides it this way. Listen to this carefully now. It says, verse 9 of Proverbs 16, a man's heart. In my heart, I'm, in my heart I want Deidre and I to have our own home debt free. God says, okay, that's good. That's a good thing. I ain't going to fight you there. That ain't trumping my rules. He had the legal department check this out. Okay, they ain't right standing. All right, now watch this. <laughs> He said, a man's heart devised his way. Listen, but the Lord. He said, I like what you want to do. Now give me your hand. Because before I was going over here, we had to go to a bank and do a 30-year mortgage for $300,000. And when I'm done with that, I would have paid them over $600,000 in total. God says, I love this. Now come, give me your hand now. I want to direct you. No, no, come. I know you won't go over there because they're telling you they can give it to you right now with no down payment. Right now, I say, come here. But God, the way you're taking me, 
You know what's over here? You don't worry about that. Keep doing what I tell you to do. Keep coming. But God, I mean, you, you got me over here to preach. You know what's across here? Keep coming. It's another incentive right now. Get your car. You didn't ask for that. You want the house. But all the more treats along the way. Keep coming. Two or three years later, I'm over here preaching, and some guy says, You, the Lord spoke to me about you. I got a whole house for you debt free. Don't fight me. Why you keep pulling away from me? Let's go. Come on, let's go. So the Bible is saying, and this, this, is what it, this is what the Constitution is saying. Listen, I am going to reward you. I'm not going to reward you the way you want me to or the way you think I should. And that's where our problem is. The next problem that we have, we come be competitive. Our friends, all of them get in their houses and so on. I want my house too. Yeah, but what your friends didn't tell you, they shackled to the bank for the next nine million years. They didn't take it a piece. And all that stuff they got in the house would look so nice. Or oh, that from rent center. <laughs> Don't get confused there. <laughs> Not from Renna Center. Don't you try that? <laughs> so the Bible says a man's heart, y'all I really want this to just sink in your heart. A man's heart devised his way. The, what God is saying, there's nothing wrong with that. That is a good thing. These are good thoughts and aspirations that you have for your marriage and for your family. You're thinking ahead. God said that's good. Now, in that same vein, I want you to be cognizant of the fact that if you want to achieve it without being stressed out, you have to allow me to direct your steps. Let's look at another scripture to bring more, more sense to this. Let's go to Psalms 37, verse 23. Psalms 37, verse 23. I love this. It says, the steps of a good man. Mm -hmm. Why you didn't say the steps of a man? So he's specifically talking to a certain person here. Because he could have said the steps of a man. He could have said the steps of a bad man. He could have said the steps of a homosexual or hetero. No, no, no. Good means beneficial. One who will benefit others. It's not just about this man. Whatever he is about to do, he is going he, he to be a benefit to others, particularly that of his family. So the Bible is saying again, the steps of a good man or a good man who will listen to God. The steps of a good man are do what? Are ordered by the Lord. He don't realize it, but because of his commitment to God and his laws, he don't really think his steps are at random. That's what he thinks. But God is the one who's just leading him on his destiny. God is the one leading this brother. And I'm speaking about me, I can be honest with you, because the way I am today, I don't know how I get here. <laughs> this wasn't my plan. No, this wasn't my plan. But I, what I do know, the consistency of doing it God's way, and especially when it comes to giving. A couple months ago, I was invited to do a one-day conference. One day conference. I know it was two days actually, but it was actually one day. And at the end of that conference, I was given a check for $10,000. And this is normal behavior, but remember, this was never, I, I didn't go to college. I don't have a no master's degree, and I don't have none of that stuff. I got none of that stuff. I know my gift though. And from what the Constitution says, it says your gift yeah. will make room be f for you. And listen, listen, it didn't finish yet, and bring you before good men. So what that simply means is that they don't have a choice. They have to call you. They're not going to say, let me see your resume, man. You, 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 you. It's Kevin again. Let me see. What you got here? I think I show you nothing. Get out of here. What is this? He says, a good man steps right now as I speak to you. If you are walking according to the laws of God. There are people out there who you don't know and who don't know you waiting on your arrival. They are waiting for you. They don't know it yet. But when you show up, they can know. That's what he's looking for right here. All that you went through was preparing you for that moment. So the Bible says that the steps of a good man, but the key is good. The one who is beneficial, the one who is doing it God's way. So him, this specific person, his steps are ordered by the Lord. This is powerful. Let's go to Proverbs 19, verse 21. 
Proverbs 19, verse 21. I like this one. It says, there are many devices in a man's heart, or many ideas or aspirations. Nevertheless, I love it again. The counsel of the Lord, only that shall prevail. So what does that mean? Okay, great. I have a bunch of ideas for DJ and I, our children, our ministry, and so on. That's beautiful. That's an awesome thing. But God says, only that which he has counseled himself on concerning you will be of any value or come to fruition. Now, that is beautiful because it teaches me how to pray now. Father, I want a debt free home. But let your counsel and your counsel alone in this area come to fruition. Because if you don't pray that way, again, he's holding your hand, but you're trying to pull him over here. He's taking you across here. God, I, hear, I see your counsel, but that take too long. Let's go across here. So he says that there are many devices or many ideas or many plans or many aspirations in your heart, but only the counsel before you were born, before you were created, in your Genesis, which is spiritual, the Bible is clearly stating here that God constantly said, and he said, Kevin, I'm going to make you great. I'm going to, you're going to preach the gospel, and I have these souls assigned to your ministry. You can go through some rough times. You can suffer some great losses. But don't get frustrated. He said, now remember my constitution. All things are working together for your good, including the bad. It may not seem so at that time, but this is going to benefit you up the road. Don't get angry. Don't get frustrated. Don't pull away. Don't go in the opposite direction. Because whatever you're going through, you, this, is, this is your college. And you're going to, when you graduate, you're going to be prepared for what I've already prepared for you. Or what I've already counseled myself on concerning you. The sad part about that statement is that most people who God has already counseled himself on will never, ever meet their destiny. And the reason for this is just what I'm saying, they don't know. So what, how do you know these people? Well, whenever you get in a conversation with them, life's so hard. Lord, you make one dollar, you gotta spend two. You put one foot forward, you gotta take two back. I can't rub two pennies together. Listen to the people who God has counseled himself concerning before the foundation of the world. So you see what a lack of knowledge does to you? No one is praying, Father, let your counsel come to pass right now. Lord, catapult me to where I should have been at this point and this stage of my life right now. But how can you pray that when you don't know that? When you're so entwined in the world system, I got to do this, I got to do that. And even when you don't meet all of their qualifications, their cousin, who never finished high school, will be your boss who's college educated. You can imagine that? No, somebody need to go to the hospital <laughs> right away. <laughs> huh? They need to admit somebody in intensive care because this is totally wrong. So that's why I say, let me do it. God says, let's go. The scripture never said your gift will make room for you and your education will bring you before good men. I didn't read that. And I'm not discounting education. No, don't get me wrong here. I tell people I educate our children, so I believe in that. But what I'm saying to you, let the constitution of creation, which are the holy scriptures, let that be your governing ruling apparatus in your life. So the Bible is very clear here. When it says to us there are many devices, Proverbs 19, verse 21, in a man's heart, nevertheless, the counsel of the Lord, that and that alone shall stand or even prevail. Right? Let's look at this last one here in this area. Proverbs 16, because you're going to see the opposite now. Proverbs 16, verse 25. Proverbs 16, verse 25. These are those who pull their hand out of God's hand. There is a way that seemeth, or even a pair, to be right unto a man. Mm -hmm. And most of us are like this, especially people who are looking to be married. So when we look at a prospect, look well, guys, you know, you look at shape, you know, you look at chest, hips, <laughs> you know, as, as if this is going to remain the same <laughs> throughout the course of life. So you ask the guy, so, so what you like about him? Well, look here, she packing. <laughs> So what you like about a man, he tall, dark, and handsome. Yes. 
<laughs> yeah, all right. Okay, so what do you like? Kids, he, he's educated. He, uh, okay, how are you going to survive? After all of the superficial cosmetic aesthetics, after we were to get used to that, now what? What are we going to do now? So the Bible say there is a way unto us that may seem right. But this, this is a prophetic scripture because God is now going to prophesy the end from the beginning if you take this route. There is a way unto man that seem right, but at the end of that man's way, what does it read? Destruction, right? So the Bible is saying you are guaranteed destruction if you take a path that God never consoled himself on concerning you. Hence, I expect divorce. I expect the collapse of a business you set out to do. I expect you to buck heads in a marriage when you are married to somebody that was never a part of God's plan for your life. Wow. See, let me take you a little bit deeper when you marry the wrong person. I've been there so I know. When you marry the wrong person, this is what you're saying, but you don't even realize it. You're saying, God, my plan is better than yours. Yeah. God, I, I know you know everything. I know you create the whole one. Fuck, you even create this one who I ain't supposed to be, but you, you, you don't know everything. I know the piece of something you don't know. Let me teach you, God. <laughs> this, this is what you basically said. So you marry someone. And I've heard these people tell you about this. We were invited to a, a marriage seminar or something, right? Like it was like a retreat, but just an afternoon. Right, right. It's a little, right. Anyway, it, was a, it wasn't a couple of days, something, it was just a one evening thing. So I'm sitting there uh, spewing all this nonsense in here, right? <laughs> so I just couldn't take it no more. <laughs> because what they were basically saying was this. You could marry anybody as long as they're Christian, right? And uh, because you're equally yoked, it's going to work out. Equally yoked. So equally yoked, based on their interpretation, means that once you are saved, then you're good to go. So what about finances, uh, different sides of the track, or this point may be emotionally damaged, or well, all of this other psychological stuff. So where when does this come in? No, 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 no. You save, right? Well, that's all you need. So, of course, as usual, I had to set them straight. <laughs> that's right, you know, they, they left me no other choice. So I said, I said, let me see if I get this straight, sir. Uh, you're saying to me, if God from the foundation of the world counsel himself that this is the woman here I've chosen for you, but I marry this woman here, you're telling me God is going to say, oh, Kevin, you know what? Uh, let me change my plan. What I had with you and DG, I can just bring it over here. Because this wouldn't be a God. This would be a puppet. So, of course, they try to get all educated me. <laughs> Mr. Ewing. <laughs> I said, <laughs> yeah. explain. I just gave you, make me understand. Well, you know what we are. Uh, uh, no, you were speaking perfect English earlier. <laughs> Talk no mess now, speak sense. <laughs> I mean, when you was up there running all that trash and spewing nonsense, you were fluent in the English vocabulary. All of a sudden now, uh, you got a frog in your throat and all kind of stuff going on. I'm here, I don't know, Give me, make me understand it because you're saying to me, sir, that if I am a Christian and let's say all the ladies in here were single, I could pick any one of these ladies, forget background, forget compatibility, forget all of that. The only qualifier is we have to be safe. I said no. Now let me tell you why. I went further because I like to bring scripture. I said... Seeing that you have a problem with your speech right now, let me assist you a little bit, all right? I said, let's go back to the rules. When God created the heavens and the earth and did all the creation and did the garden, and he brought Adam in the garden, right? He made him out of the dust and so on. And every part of the creation was good to God. But then he said, except that the man should not be what? Alone. Now, it didn't mean it was a flaw in his creation. Every other animal had their mate. 
except for Adam, right? Now watch this now. I want you to see where this cloud was talking nonsense to me. He didn't bring in the garden Eve and Tracy and Nicole and say, Adam, you pick anyone now. God, you pick whoever you want to pick. He didn't even do it with the animals. Even with the animals, this is you. Ba, 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 the pig, the goat, everyone. I am seeing structure. I am seeing order. I am seeing a sequence. He didn't say, okay, horsey, horsey. Now you got the goat over there, the pig. Pick whoever you want. Wow. I didn't see that. So when I look at structure, you're going to appreciate rules. It's going to make you think before you leap. Yeah. See, before you just was following the trend. Okay, uh, she pretty or he handsome. Let me run with that because the reality is when my friend send me with her and she's so pretty and we and I convertible and all I hear blown all over the place. It may not be real, but anyway, it blown all over here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that no, 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 you're missing the whole exercise because you, you can pay daily for that. <laughs> Including the weave you can pay for, but nevertheless. <laughs> God is very intentional. That's what I've been hearing this entire series. He's intentional. So I said to this gentleman, I said, sir, even with that analogy, I heard you said on numerous occasions during this session how uh, God has a plan for our lives. I said, but I'm confused because if he has a plan for our life, why would he leave the second most important thing outside of salvation, at random. You're telling me you have no plan in terms of who we should be with, that we can pick whoever we want to pick? My God. But yet I'm reading, a man have many devices in his heart, but it's the Lord that's leading him? It's the Lord that, they're, okay, well if that's the case, then who is directing me to when you tell me I can pick anybody? Right. So this was a part of a lot of stuff you was taught over the years, you now begin to trash out. This is ain't making no sense. And how I know it's not making no sense, you have such a super rate of divorce. Why? Because people are marrying people they should have never been with from the beginning. And then when you get after that, after you don't do the mistake, right? Well, you know, uh, if you get married again, you know you're going straight to hellfire, right? You are aware of that, right? And you know God is going to kill you. And uh, no matter how safe you are, all this nonsense, right? But maybe that's another lesson for another time. So, so the constitutional laws of God are his divine orders as it relates to marriage. Meaning that you, if you add something to it or take something away from it, it is not God's laws anymore. But something even worse happens to the one who is actually engaging in such behavior. The Bible says that anyone who adds or take away from God's word, he says then let that person be a curse. So in other words, if two men and, or two women come to be married at an altar and uh, calling this God, the Bible says whoever is performing that as well as those who are engaging in it, they are under a curse. In fact, you can write the scripture down, Genesis, Galatians chapter 1, verse eight, verses 8 to verse 9. And Paul said to the church of Galatia, he says, listen, he says, if anyone in my entourage, including me or even an angel, uh, speak or preach any gospel other than what we are preaching, he says, let that person be a curse. I think the book of Revelation said that whoever ought to take away from the word of God, let his or her name be taken out of the book of life. So you see the intensity as it relates to the penalty of violating, polluting the laws, the rules. Because you're telling God he doesn't know what he's doing. You the creation, you're saying, I got more sense than you the creator. Mm. So you order line. Yeah. So this is why you, you cannot go with the crowd, particularly when they're going against the laws of God, right? right. So let's go to Genesis chapter 2. Genesis chapter 2, and we can look from verse 22 to verse 24, right? We're going to see your order, like I would have mentioned earlier. So Genesis chapter 2, beginning at uh, verse 22 to verse 24, it says, And the rib, sorry, verse 21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, okay, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. Verse 22 of Genesis 2. And the rib which the Lord had taken from Adam made he Jane, Tracy, Eve. <laughs> you didn't read that, right? 
he made he made who? Let me see. Let me read it again. Maybe my this thing print different. And the rib which the Lord gave, the Lord God had taken from Adam, made he a woman. I'm not an English scholar, but I think the word woman is singular, meaning one woman, right? And he then brought her unto the man. I want y'all to see. I know y'all read this before, but I'm breaking it down so you can see the sequence. So God made Eve, but he made Eve specifically for who again? Ah, mm -hmm. And then Eve went and run him down. Mm -mm. I didn't read that. What I did read, though, he, come here, Eve. I will now take you to Adam. Let me take a little deeper. Write the scripture on Proverbs chapter 18, verse 22. Because it can going to show us the flip side now. 18, verse 22. Proverbs 18, verse 22. Now, we just read just now. The Bible says, after he created Eve, he brought her to Adam. He brought her. So, Proverbs 18, verse 22, it says, he, the male, that find it. Cycle that word. So, who should be in search here? Ah! He that findeth a wife. So I didn't hear she's supposed to be the one pursuing. Now here is when you do it God's way according to that rule. We just read where God brought Eve. I don't mind let you search. But the truth is I got it right here. I got it right here. Now if you, if you, I know you got a lot of little other chicks in your heart. Now if you go your way, you are bound for destruction. But if you follow my way, I got her here. She right here. Adam all over the place, all over and cue ball up and looking off like a pretty curly hair woman. And see, something wrong with you. <laughs> Get over here. <laughs> but watch this when, when God plan come together. So Eve, God always had her. And now he's bringing her to Adam, who he put this hunter spirit in. And the Bible says in Proverbs 18, verse 22, he that findeth a wife, listen, finds a good thing. The word good again means that which is going to be beneficial to this man. And watch the reward now when the two that's supposed to be come together. And now this guy is entitled to favor from the Lord now. All because he connected with whom God had counseled himself on before the foundation of the world. I had to ask the same pastor, how you explain that to me? Ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah. Uh. <laughs> Come on, you've been speaking English. All of a sudden, you talking Dutch? <laughs> no, man, no. No, and that's years of telling people nonsense and keeping you in bondage with ignorance. So when you break it down to people, it, it causes them to think differently. You know what? The time I spend, especially the men, I run here running behind these girls and, and getting in these relationships and all this foolishness. Let me back off, man. Yeah. Let me be led by God. Let me do what is right. And by default, fall in alignment where God already have planned for me. But if I don't know that, I'll be on the hunt all my life, you know, doing a bunch of nonsense. So the Bible says here in verse 22, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, therefore, rules now, that's what I was saying to you all earlier. That's why I couldn't wait to jump on it when Tracy brought it up, right? <laughs> I couldn't wait because I, I, I understand these things. And that is, God is saying now, remember the Bible says God knows the end of something from the beginning. So the beginning, which when you got married, God, he knows the end of this. He knows how this is going to turn out. So he's giving an instruction, I hope you are ready for this, to two people who does not have a mother and a father. He's telling them, Adam specifically, for this reason, a man should leave his mother and father and to what mommy and daddy I got. I'm Adam, I'm the first brother, he ain't nobody. Who, what are you talking about? God is speaking futuristically. I know this can be a problem in the future for most marriages, if not all, where you have people who don't respect matrimonial holiness. 
This is my son. This is my daughter. I, I fall on and get up. Well, the days of falling on has come to a cease radio. Yeah. This is mine now. Yeah. If you have a problem with that, you go to the Lord of land and Christ. So God, and I, every time I read that, I get so, I think that is so interesting. Adam and Eve had no mommy. Yeah. They had no daddy. But yet God is going to say, for this reason, you, Adam, again, he went, because you know the word Adam means man. Yeah. Right. So he said, for this reason, you should leave mommy and daddy. He didn't say brother and sister. He always know the root would have been the parents. <laughs> he said, leave mommy and daddy, and now cleave to your wife. Now let's be clear. He didn't say hate mommy and daddy. He didn't say didn't he don't help mommy and daddy. He didn't say those things. You can still do those things that you want to do. Yeah. But you need to know who and what is priority. So he made it abundantly clear as it relates to the rules. See, that's why I like rules. We're speaking rules here. All right? So, like I said to you earlier, in Proverbs 18, verse 22, it says that he that findeth a wife, so that means that man should always be in search. And when I say in search, meaning that the woman shouldn't be the one hunting down men. All right? So I want you to go to Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, we're going to read from verse 6 to verse 9. Mark chapter 10, verse 6 to verse 9. And listen to what it says. Mark chapter 10, verse 6 says, But from the beginning of the creation, listen, listen, there's a rule. God made them what? Male and female. Verse 8. And they twain, or those two, shall be what? One flesh. So then they are no more two, but are what? They are one. Who two became one? The man and the woman. Now, did you read in there? The man, the woman, mummy. You didn't read that? Man, the woman, papa. Man or the woman for his cousin, third cousin, whoever. You didn't read none of that. So the Bible rules are very clear as it relates to the, the, the holy matrimony. And he says the two will become one flesh. Now, this is the part I want you to get. Look at verse 9 now. This is, this is very, very much key. What therefore God, circle that word, not you, not your cousin, not your culture. Because cultures bring, like, I mean, I'm not going to, I just, they're my familiar with Indian culture. They pick who you marry. Yeah. You don't have that, that, that privilege. Oh, mommy, I like her. Yeah, you may like her, but you go marry her. <laughs> <laughs> so why am I saying this? I'm saying this to you. I could go here today, but I do a whole teaching on uh, uh, marriage, divorce, and remarriage, and to undo a lot of misconceptions as it relates to scripture. But the Bible says, whom God has put together. Now, let me ask you guys, do you believe that every marriage was ordained by God? No. Okay, if you believe that, then let's read what the scripture says. The scripture says in verse 9 of Mark 10, it says, what therefore God had put, had joined together, let no man put asunder. Now, why am I telling you this? I just can touch on it just a little bit, because I, I, I will save my teaching, because there's a several part teaching on this. Everybody's coming after me with it. Okay? <laughs> First of all, let me talk about me. Uh, I was divorced. I have never asked to be divorced. I didn't want to get a divorce. My wife decided that uh, I cannot be ruled because she's very controlling. Mm -hmm. And she's figured, well, okay, if you don't want to be ruled, ruled, then I got to bring this to an end. Mm -hmm. At first, when she uh, came at me with it, uh, I didn't want it to happen because, number one, uh, when I got married, I wanted to be married for life. Mm -hmm. I also came from a background prophecy church whereby if you get a divorce, you must be a eunuch after that, right? <laughs> so. <laughs> That wasn't happening yet, but anyway. <laughs> Nevertheless, all of this church stuff was in my head. But anyway, she, I tried to talk out of it. We, no, she just, well, she told me, you either do what I tell you do, or, yeah, well, it's easy for me to fix that. Wow. Yeah, this, this is saying nothing difficult, man. It's very, very easy to go. Yeah, so you go your baby man, get a divorce. And long story short, uh, it wasn't what I wanted. Now, let me be clear here with this. I want to be clear. I don't want no misconceptions. At this point, there was no love there. But the truth was, I thought about it, because we have the two girls together, my children, and I, I never wanted them to be 
outside of my marriage. I didn't want that, and I, and I stooped to many low levels of embarrassment and shame to prevent that from happening, but you cannot make a person do what they don't want to do. That's their mind. So when I went to my pastor about it, uh, and I told him what was happening, I was keeping him up to date, and he said something to me, <laughs> boy, I tell you. When I told him my whole story, he said to me, he said, Kevin, uh, this ain't gonna look good on the church. Oh, wow. This ain't gonna look good on the church. I just tell this fellow, my liver is just about on the floor. The pain is incredible. I, I, the, I, all he was concerned about, he said, you're a young minister and you know, you're a good teacher and all that. And you know, people attracted to your ministry. And, uh, and so much more is he saying that you should stay in there. I said, but how, I, how can I stay in something that somebody else doesn't want to be in? But he wasn't hearing that. Old Baptist preacher, they hear nothing. No, they bully their wives. But anyway, so I said to him, she wants to get a divorce, so there's nothing I can do. So we got a divorce, and of course I moved on with my life. So when I really, really got into ministry, this became an issue. But people, uh, you were married before, and if your wife is living, blah, blah, blah. So I went and I studied it extensively. And coming right back to this right here, the Bible says that what God has put together let no man put a sun down. And then we went over there to, I think, 2 Corinthians 7, where the Apostle, Apostle Paul speaks extensively about marriage. Very, and I want you all really to read that scripture again. And when you read it this time, read it under this understanding. He's speaking about two marriages. He's speaking about the marriage that we just read about, what God has put together. He says, if God has put this together from the foundation of the world, even if you all divorce and you all want to get remarried, then you all have to marry each other because this was God's plan. Right. Then he said, but for the unbelievers, believers, read it, read it for yourself. Mm -hmm. He says, if the unbelieving spouse decide to leave, God has called us to peace. Mm -hmm. Again, we ain't going to do that. That's a whole new different story, right? But the point I was making here is if God has called this marriage, if you know that this is God. Now, people say to me, but Kevin, ah, you know it's Jesus who called me here. <laughs> well, first of all, put your petty feelings out of the way. And what I, what I mean by that, people quick to dismiss Jesus when their spouse make them mad. Well, I don't know if I could live with him. Well, what do you do? He, he just don't put the seat down in the toilet. I don't know if I can put up with this. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. <laughs> so, so you really, you really, that's why I tell people, you all, if you all follow me, I say all the time, read the Bible for yourself. Do not leave that responsibility up to somebody else because they're going to tell you what was handed down to them. Yeah. I'm not trying to change nobody's views. Listen to what I say. Don't even believe me. Go and read the scriptures for yourself. Ask God for understanding. Yes. That's all I'm saying to you. So he says, what God has put together, let no man take asunder. Right? Now watch this. The laws, because this is what a marriage is going to break down to. And that's why I brought that point up. A marriage from God is a marriage of synergy. Yeah. Yes. Write that down. A marriage from God is a marriage of synergy. Yeah. Now, what does synergy mean? Synergy is where two or more people come together to produce more than what they were producing as individuals. Yeah. So let's look at some scriptures. All right? So Mark 10, verse 8, see in Mark, Mark 10, verse 8, listen to what it says. And the two shall be what? One. So we're seeing a protocol now. Because as I would have said with the antagonistic marriage, you, you have two. But we ain't no one up in here. Let's be clear. I, I, I pay the bills up in here. You do what I say. You bow to me. So we still got the two. But the two don't see themselves as one. So the truth is we bucking heads. And what happened with me doing this? When we should have been doing this together, we in one spot. So we never progress. Everybody else going past us. Why? Because they understand synergy. And synergy is going to take us forward. But the antagonistic group is just challenging. But this is the worst part. The worst part is that the kids are watching this. That's a whole new teacher. Generational curses and all that other stuff. So he says in Mark 10 verse 8, And they too shall be one flesh. So then there are no more two, but they are one. 
See, if this don't sink as one, listen, when DJ and I got married, because I told you, I said, DJ, let me be clear here. Crystal, I said, and this one I done been through a lot of pain with the divorce and all that stuff, I said, DJ, whoever I call my girlfriend will be my wife. That means I would have already run you through the scan machine, Google you up, <laughs> and do everything to make sure I do not repeat that mistake again. I, I had to. So her record came back clean. All right, <laughs> okay, right? But she could tell you, when we decided to get married, we didn't set the date and everything. All of my accounts, I went and put them on. There was nothing hidden. I, was, I tell her I was open, I got nothing to hide. This is what I'm dealing with. I'm an honest person. I ain't coming into this being deceptive. I ain't planting those type of seeds up in here because that's what we can get up the road. I ain't into that. And she could tell you. And to this day, there's no secret. There's no private account. There's no, there's no none of that. Why? The two shall become what? One. But here's the catch though. You see, before you become one in a physical marriage, you should have been one already mentally. Right. Why take on somebody who don't make up your mind as well? They ain't gonna know it on my account. I ain't giving them this right. and they don't know I got my mummy as the beneficiary on the insurance. What you deal, what you get married for? Right. Yeah. Why, why are you why are you going through this effort to waste someone else's time? If you listen, if, if you want to be deceptive, don't you you could stay single and do it all you want. Yeah. Why bring someone to know something that they have no knowledge of what you're dealing with? Yeah. My former maid, <laughs> I may joke about it, but she will tell you, okay, Kevin, this here is yours. And, and this is mine. <laughs> Let's be clear. <laughs> okay? Let's be clear. For real. When Rao they come, with those dishes with the gold stuff on it, they 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 my own. And I couldn't believe this because I'm not used to this. I, I couldn't understand. And that's why I'm telling you, listen to me carefully. I don't let people talk foolishness to y'all. Life is not set up where you can marry anybody. Not every marriage God brought together. <laughs> I lived this, so I know. I didn't want to live this, but this was imposed on me. And I came up, not bitter, but have a greater understanding of, of how these things work. So you got to be very, very careful of these people you're getting involved with. Let's go now to Ecclesiastes. This is so deep. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. Ecclesiastes chapter 4. And we're going to read from verse 9 to verse 12. Again, we're going to talk more about synergy. And this is what we're going to make your marriage powerful. And you know what's so beautiful about it? You could be broke. You could be uneducated. But if you do it God's way, yes, yes. favor is greater than education. Favor is greater than money. God is going to reward you every step of the way. Every step. Whatever you put your hand to, have to prosper. Amen. Have to. So, let's go delve a little deeper into the, the synergy relationship. Ecclesiastes 4. And these are all, everything that I'm reading to you are rules. Keep that in mind. Ecclesiastes chapter 4, beginning at verse 9. Listen, two are what? Better than one. Let's stop right there. So, God is saying there's a part of your life. Where you, as a single person, there's a part that you're supposed to do on your own, but there's going to come a stage in your life where you have to be connected, but not to anybody, to the right person, yeah. to be catapulted to where you should be. So he says, two are better than one, and he's going to give the reasons. Because they, listen, listen, they have a what? A good reward for their labor. God is saying, whatever these two who think, who, who are one in mind, spirit, body, and soul, the Bible says, whatever they, there's a reward for their efforts. There's a reward for their labor. In so much words, the synergy relationship will always produce good. Yes. You only hear me, you know, that's not an option. Yes. You, I say to you, well, if, if you do it together, it might work out. Ah! By default, it will work out. Yes. Whatever. Yes. You riding through these neighborhood, baby, I can put you there one day. Just work with me. You see the house that we can own that there one day. Amen. And I don't want to hear coming out of your mouth. Once we get the down payment, we're down payment. He didn't find that a wife finds a good thing and he's entitled to favor. Amen. It's not an option. People don't know the rules. They don't get the rules. They stay talking like the world. Boy, baby, if you only can get $50,000 and pay that down to the bank, and for the next 10.6 million years, we can pay this off. <laughs> no, man. You ought to order. <laughs> no. 
So the Bible says two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. Yeah. All right? Verse 10 of Ecclesiastes 4. For if they fall, the one will lift up his fellow. Why? Because I need DJ. I don't need you to be, come get up here. I don't need you to, let's, let's hop here if you have to. Because according to the rule, I need you and you need me for us to get a good reward as an end result. We ain't gotta do it the world way. Deidre and I just bought a home, debt free. Amen. Debt free. <laughs> debt free. And she could tell you in the beginning, like she said, when I was doing what I was giving, are you crazy? What are you, we need that. <laughs> Very dramatic. <laughs> so I, say, I say, you trust me? I say, listen to me carefully. Because I, I know I go on by the rules. So, as I start doing conferences and stuff, and again, like most of you would know, I don't charge for conferences, I don't ask for honorariums. When folks ask me how much is your, I say I don't, this is my belief, this isn't nothing for everybody. I say, would the Lord put it in me? I am never to demand an honorarium. I am never to ask for it. If you offer it, this is what I say. Whatever the Lord leads you to do. The only thing I require, when I'm invited, I don't ever leave it with this woman. And if you invite me, then you take care of the accommodations and so on. I come to execute. Now, whatever you want to do, that on you. But that has worked for me tremendously. Yeah, amen. Conference after conference, I was paid thousands of dollars. 60,000, 50,000, 10,000, you name it. Think about it, it's there, yeah? And what we did, I save, 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 save. I said, D, watch, watch and see. I said, you gotta get that bank mentality out of your head. I done had my times of that. And at this point, she will tell you I would have lost everything. I had, I had a, a fourplex. I was always shrewd when it comes to finances. But of course I lost all of it, I lost my property. In fact, I had to move back home with my mother. At 40 years old, I had to move back home with my mother. And uh, thank God I treat her, right? Are <laughs> you serious? <laughs> Thank God I treated her right. Yeah. She welcomed me with open arms. And I had about two years of a struggle. The bank came and take the fourplex and they took the property and some days I didn't even have gas, but I was working. I, I didn't get promoted or nothing yet. And that's when I went on the 40 day fast and things just began to uh, flip and turn. Thanks. Right, but this is what I'm making. So what I did, I said I'm not gonna go that route anymore where I saved up for a down payment to go to a bank, because I look at the rules and it says that if I find a good thing, uh, I should obtain favor from the Lord. I look at the law of synergy. I say, okay, and I know DG is what God had for me, that I knew. So I say, okay, I'm in right alignment. And how I knew I was in alignment, favor every now and then would come. And like I told you, God, this is how God gave you incentive. Okay, you keep coming, hey, you're not this here for you. Keep coming, this only is an incentive, because the big deal up here, keep coming, keep coming. Oh my God. So when we would have accumulate, the money is we were able to go and buy the house cash. Hmm. Hmm. While I was doing that, Amazing. before that, sorry, I paid off all my debt. Hmm. So sometimes it left me broke, but I didn't care. I just ain't coming this road no more. So we paid off all our debt, took care of all of that while saving. I was able to pay off my uh, son's school fee from college. That was $151,000 I knocked wow. out in three years. Wow. Right. So oh, because I've, see here, if you don't have it here, you will be a slave till you, you, you'll be doing this all your life. Yeah. So you have to make those sacrifices, but you gotta realize while you're the head, while you're the man, you cannot do it without her, even if she don't work. Mm -hmm. Because the requirement, the protocol is two are better than one. Yes. So when I hear men say, well, honey, you know, you wouldn't have been nothing without me. The Bible says, if you find her, you get favor. <laughs> None of you do it on your own. So we were able to wipe out all the debt. Because I told her, I said, listen, I'm a man, I can be 52 in September. And I made up my mind a long time ago. I wasn't working for nobody, no, I ain't do none of that. So I retired from my job, FedEx at, in 2019. I was 49 years old, 48 at the time, was going to be 49. I left it, FedEx was paying me extremely well. Oh, baby, I was an account executive uh, with territories of Tortola, the Turks and Caicos, the Bahamas, except Nassau. Mm -hmm. 
and I was living well. I mean, she'll tell you, with bonuses and stuff, we was doing well. But I knew God had called me full-time to ministry. Now, I was doing better in ministry at the time, even while I was at FedEx. In fact, my ministry was paying me more, but I didn't get the pull to go as yet. Right. So, December of 2018, I had a, we was on a fast. I did the yearly end of the year fast. And we came in agreement that, you know, ask God to let us know if this is the time to leave. A couple of months later, we had a, had a conference in Jersey, did that conference, and the gentleman who knew nothing about what I was dealing with, and he said, he said, you, you should have been off that job a long time ago. Oh. Well, he did not have done me that twice. <laughs> right? yeah. And then he went over this wrong prophecy. He said, oh, God is going to bless you. He said, the day you leave that job, you're going to watch your finances just pull off. Again, you know what I'm thinking? I'm connected to the right person. I'm walking in synergy. I'm walking to the best of my ability according to the laws of God. Now, that, that doesn't mean that there weren't temptations along the way to go do it this way or try to do it this way financially or invest over here. They, they came. But I say, no, 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 I can, I can slip up. I can pass up on that. <sighs> Long story short, I left FedEx and my income Double at the end. Of, I left FedEx in uh, July of 2019, but I, by December, my income had doubled of what I was making to FedEx. Remember now, remember, the two shall become one. The Bible says two is better than one, that even if one fall, you better hurry pick that one up. Because what? that's why I said to that clown the other day, I couldn't get rid of her and say, let me bring Tracy on board and God can do the same thing. It, 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 it don't work that way. This is the one you are assigned to. This is the one who favor has been ordained for your life by this person and this one alone. That's right. You know how many people out there who favor with di in different relationships right now that should be with them? And they will, they, they're trying to figure out how come I'm not succeeding when I have all the education, all the favor, and I come from the right tribe. Well, you're not properly connected. So, but listen to what the description, I can finish up my story because I won't get this piece in here. He says here in verse 10, if, Ecclesiastes 4 verse 10, if they fail, that's, that's the two now, if they fail, the one will lift up his fellow, but listen, but woe to him that is alone. Woe to him that is alone when he falleth. For he had not another to help him up. Verse 11, again, he's reiterating, if two lie together, then they have heat. But how can one be warm alone? Verse 12, and if one prevail against him, or someone coming to challenge him, two shall withstand him. And a three-fourth cord is not quickly broken. So the Bible here is giving us the law of synergy and the importance of it. And again, we're talking about a marriage. And that's why you cannot look at your, you, if you don't look at your spouse as equal to you in God's sight, you're doing your spouse and your marriage a disservice. You can't look at it and say, well, you didn't go to college. I've been to college. Mm -hmm. What would that have to do with that, what we just read? Yes, yes, if you don't see her as your equal, as one, the Bible says the two shall now become one. Okay, in Genesis 2 and verse uh, 22. And then he now comes in Ecclesiastes now explain the benefit or the profit that will come as a result of this union. And I tell you, people, boy, I, I wish people had told me this when I was up in church, you know, because your decision in the relationship making would have been much more informative. You would now make a better decision. But what you were doing was doing what everybody else did. She pretty. He handsome. He got his own car, right? <laughs> oh. He lived with his mommy. I want to do with him. You don't know his potential. You don't know if that's what God got for you. So you're based in your entire future that he's temp in this temporary place that he or she is in. So you see why you gotta extinguish and distinguish the, the cosmetics and the, the aesthetics. That's just surface. You have a whole gem underneath all of this dross and dirt. But you cannot see it because you are trained from a secular perspective that if you ain't coming through the door rich, ain't nothing happening here. No, you're doing yourself a, a, a disservice. So watch this now. Let's go to Genesis chapter 11, because now we're going to see, I just gave you the law of, 
a synergy and, 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 and an antagonistic antagonism. So let's go to Genesis 11, verses 6 and 9. And you're going to see these two laws bind together. So Genesis chapter 11, and we're going to read from verse 6 to verse 9. This is very, very powerful. All right, so you're going to see this law didn't just pop up. This was always here. So, of course, just to give you some background here, this is the Tower of Babel. All right, and they were building this uh, tower to go up into the heavens. But at this time, and this is the first time the Bible ever spoke about a worldly kingdom. And it says that uh, Nimrod, actually, Nimrod, who was the leader of these men, were building this tower. Now, Nimrod was a very, very evil man. The Bible called him a mighty hunter. He came from the, from the lineage of Ham, which was Noah's second son, I believe. Anyway, they decide to build this tower. And at this time in the world, there was only one language in the world. There was no multiple language like Spanish, Dutch, and so on. So let's just say that the language was English. Well, everybody spoke it. So they decide to build this tower. Now, what made them successful when the Bible clearly dictates that they were evil men? Because when we hear that we should be like, they should fail in life, not if they follow in principles. And that's what you're about to see right now. So watch this now. So the Bible says here, well, let's start actually from verse 2. It says, and it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar, and they dwelt there. And they said one to another, go to, let us make brick and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and slime had they for mortar. And they said, go to, let us build us a city and a tower whose top may reach unto heaven. And let us make us a name, lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the earth. So what do you see so far? Listen to what they said. They said, now let us go and make brick and mortar. You didn't sit and say, now hold on now, I have the degree. I'm not making no mortar. I don't know about you. I'm not toting no bricks. Who do you think I am? I want to be in charge. No, everybody was on one accord. So when you're, everybody's on one accord, you success and forward motion becomes the inevitable because yeah. when you're always bucking heads, you got to stop the row. Yeah. <laughs> you got to stop to point fingers. You got to stop to criticize. You got to stop to talk about the past. But once you are one accord, you are unstoppable. You will continue to go forward. Amen. So these wicked brutes even knew that. <laughs> so verse 5. This was so interesting that it caught the attention of God. So verse 5 of Genesis 11 says, And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of men built. Now we are about to see a rule now. And this rule is going to show why they were so successful. So verse 6 says, And the Lord said, Behold, because you're going to see the components that is making the system work. <laughs> the components that's going to make the system work. That's engineering time, right? They don't, don't get mad at me. <laughs> there you go, there you go, there you go. The mechanics. It says, and the Lord said, Behold, the people is one. He's showing you the credentials that they possess to bring about the results that they were getting. The people were one. We are all, no matter what you are, you could be the carpenter, you could be the mason, you could be the architect. In our minds, we are all one. That's one part of it. The second part, we are all one language. We're not speaking against one another. We're not bucking heads. We're not doing any of that. So we're on one accord with one language. And what did the rules say will happen? Nothing that they imagine shall be hindered or withheld from them. Scripture, rules, principles. Let me see if I get this straight. Did they go to motor college? I didn't read that. <laughs> huh? Did they go to the, the slime producing uh, uh, plant? I didn't read that. What I did read is that they saw each other equally. Yes. This is my wife. This is your husband. You aim higher than me and I'm not higher than you. We are on one accord. We in this together. We must speak with one voice. So as a result of that, success becomes the inevitable. Everyone you see that is failing in their marriage, they are not standing as one. They are not on one accord. They are not speaking the same language. Deidre said earlier, you can't talk bad about your husband and wife. 
You know, I don't want to go, you know, I don't speak a one language. Yeah, well, how you treat you? Well, he all right. Buy me this break up, 2021 Mercedes. <laughs> 2021, wow. My God, my friend Susie got a whole 2023. And he come talking nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> you know why Susie get it? Because Susie and her husband speak on one accord. That's, right. That's why she get it. Susie and her husband, they speak in with one voice and they stand in as one. Yes. So she can get more than 2024, Missy. She can get much more than that. Why? Because they're on one accord. See, you got to understand the rules and the laws of synergy. Seeing each other as one. If you don't, these are not my rules. I'm reading them from the scripture, so this is not Kevin's opinion. This is what the Bible, wherever you are, fa if you are failing financially in your marriage, if you are failing emotionally, trust me, the, the, the core ingredient, there's not a oneness here, there's not a one voice. Yeah. The day you correct those two right there, and now begin to see things together and going forward together, watch how things change by default. Yeah. By default, it's going to change. So he says in verse 6 of Genesis 11, And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one, and they have all one language. And this they begin to do, and now nothing will be restrained from them which they have imagined to do. Now listen, that's the law of synergy. Now watch the law of antagonism. So verse 7 says, God says, Now go to, let us go down, and now what? Confound their language. How do I successfully... Drive a wedge between the detailers. Nicole, I know you love Michaela, and he's a nice guy. I don't even tell you this. But I saw him talking to Mary. Now, I think it's nothing bad, you know. But I think she's a little bit too close, whispering something. Uh -oh. Come on, Mr. Kevin. Now, Nicole's problem would be. The same problem you would have. Why are you entertaining Satan? Why are you entertaining Satan? So, who you say he was with again? Now, that's between us, right? Because, you know, I don't talk people business. Right, why are you talking now? Why? What makes me so special that you're talking to me now, right? So, what happens now? The whole idea between that is to now confuddle or change the word Babel literally means to confuse yeah. before this nonsense you are on one accord before this nonsense you had no reason to suspect your husband or nothing and you allow this outsider this foreigner this tr intruder of this holy matrimony even if it's true yeah. why did you allow this person to come here and put this wedge and push it in here and watch what the Bible says that Write the scripture out in Proverbs, so the Proverbs are Matthew 13, verse 25. It says, while man slept, his enemy came and sowed tears among the wheat. And watch what he did after he done planted. Now he goes his way. He done set the trap. Now he's just going to sit here now. And let me see how they can act over here now. Let me watch the division. The seeds already planted. They already absorbed that seed. Let me watch the, 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 the harvest now. So my point is, remember the, the, the synergy here. You cannot allow anyone, family, daddy. That's why God says, when a man finds a wife, leave mommy and daddy and cleave to your wife. God never said, if you cleave to mommy and daddy, then you can get a favor. I never read that. Never read it. And I don't think I can ever read it. <laughs> the favor is with your wife. You cannot allow nobody to come and pollute because the pollution, the idea behind it, they don't even realize it, is to bring discord yes. in that marriage. That's what's going to happen. So the Bible says here in verse 7, go to, let us go down there and confound, or that word means to confuse their language, that they may not understand one another. You all hear this? So guess what? The fellow who was toting this with all the mortar and the bricks, they put it over here and they start putting it up. Because all of them could speak English. We're on one accord, one language. So how does God mess this whole thing up? Change their language. So the fellow come here to break. Uh, 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 <laughs> <laughs> what, what, what? Are you away? <laughs> Listen to the next scripture. And they now scattered as a result of it. Wow. My God. 
And that's what an antagonistic relationship does. It is to scatter the victims. It is to pull them apart. It is to cause them to be stuck in one place and to blame everybody else except themselves. So the Bible says, verse 7, go to, let us go down, and they confound their language that they may not understand one another's speech. Verse 8, so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of the earth, and they left building the city. You left your marriage because someone talked nonsense to you. All that property you all had, all of those businesses you all had, all of this you've given up because you allowed a snake to, to, to weasel its way into your relationship. He, the, the snake didn't physically pull you apart. S -s -s the serpent Satan did not pull Adam away from Eve. She entertained him. And changed the whole language. The language was, you must not eat of the fruit. He came in there and says, you know what? God holding back from you. You see this creation? You do know if you eat this, you could create just like this, right? Yeah. And it was so convincing that not only did she eat it, she gave it to Adam. Adam never questioned her. Adam said, one fruit isn't sufficient, give me two. <laughs> so let's look at some specific rules for husband and wives as part of this marital union to keep this synergy intact. We've got to look at more order. So we're going to go here to 1 uh, Corinthians chapter 1, chapter 11, sorry. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at... Uh, Verse 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2 says, Now I praise you, brethren, that you remember me in all things, that keep the what? Ordinance, or the order, or the commands, or laws of God as I deliver them to you. But I would have you know, this is Paul talking to the church of Corinth, and he's about to lay out order. God is a God of what? Order. But I would have you know that the head of every man, this is the order, is who? Christ. And the head of the woman is who? The man and the head of Christ is who? God. Let me park here just for a little minute. Because back home they hate me when I talk about this. No spiritual leaders you're covering. Let's be abundantly clear. Your pastor is not your covering. Amen. And much less your wife. The order is right there. So when I back home I say, Why, why where did all these spiritual orphans pop up? Yeah. <laughs> Now they get upset with me, but you only upset because you don't know what the Bible says. The Bible says the head of every man is who? Christ. And who is the head of the woman? The man. And who is the head of Christ? God. So my pastor couldn't be my, he couldn't be my covering. Because what I'm doing, I'm squeezing him in between me and Christ. And how could he cover my wife when he got his own wife? <laughs> Fellow think he is. How much would you want, preacher? <laughs> so the Bible is clear. The Bible tells you, think about this for a second. Let me give you this better analogy. Okay. All right. Lou and Tracy here. Watch this. This is his wife. Because remember, the way that our marriages are patterned is after Christ's relationship with his bride, which is the church. Right? Okay. So Christ is the groomsman and the church is the bride. Who man that you know of in his right mind leaves his bride in the charge of another man? Make me understand that. Mikhail, make me understand that. Please, <laughs> work with me, <laughs> okay? That's like you saying, okay, uh, I'm going away, Nicole, so I'm going to bring Peter over here to cover you while I'm gone. My God. Now, unless Peter will meet Jesus a little bit earlier than he's supposed to, <laughs> that could work. <laughs> I'm giving you that analogy because when a pastor, an apostle, or whoever say to you that he or she is your covering, and particularly your wife, cover, he doesn't have that. Where did he get that right from? Christ is the head. Any covering that she needs outside of Christ will come from who he says. So I'm showing you the disorder that is imposed in a religious way 
but you will never think that this is the reason why you're not going forward. So when I hear that nonsense, I say, well, listen, y'all better get from Rami that nonsense, right? With recovery. So listen, <laughs> on my radio show, right? There was this pastor back home. He believed strongly in covering. You remember you hearing my spiritual sons and daughters, you know? And they, and they literally have to report to him every Saturday to give him an itinerary of what they're going to do for the week so he can cover it. All right, yeah. Because I'm figuring if you're so super covering, you should know what I can do already. But anyway, forget that. <laughs> so guess what? On my radio show, because I had learned that he had COVID. So bad that they had to airlift him. And I think one of his lungs almost collapsed. So I couldn't wait to get on my radio show that Saturday. So I had nice talk specifically about covering. And I said, uh, I'm kind of confused. Because the one who claims to cover couldn't cover himself. <laughs> So where was your covering when COVID put you in the headlock? Where was your covering when you would have dared to airlift you to America to keep you alive? Where if you couldn't cover you, how you would cover me? I'll pass on that one. Because your covering looks lethal. I don't want to do that, no. So I'm trying to get people to think, why do you let this is the reason why you're not going forward? You're committing to rules that is contrary to the laws of God. And as a result of that, you will become stagnant in life. That's your covering right there. This is your covering right here. This is your, this what your Bible did. You read it, right? We read it together. So I'm trying to figure out how could a person read it and still come up with it. I don't care what you say, Kevin. My class is my covering. Okay, then. Let him continue to be your covering. Unless you're far, you're going to get in life. So the order is set out here. And of course, in this particular order, God is making it clear through the Apostle Paul to the church of Corinth. Why? Because whenever God is getting ready to bless, to give favor, or do what he intended before the foundation of the world with your life, the order of things must be in place. God will never give you that wife or that husband if the order isn't set. If you haven't disciplined yourself and do what you're supposed to be doing, it ain't gonna happen. Why would he give you something to pollute that poison's life? No, it don't work that way. So watch this. So he now goes and gives these rules. Let's go to Ephesians chapter five, right? I just wanted to show you that order first. So Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 21. And we're going to read the verse, quickly verse 33. So verse 21 says, Submit yourselves one to another. And uh, listen, this is the key in the fear of God. The word fear doesn't mean to be afraid. It means reverential fear. It means to honor or to respect God. So he says, even when you don't feel like submitting yourself or doing what is right to your partner, remember God here. This got nothing to do with you no more. This got to do with the order that God has put in place. And if you if you say you love God, then you should honor the rules that he put in place for your marriage. So the Bible says in verse 21 of Ephesians 5, submit or humble yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Yeah. Not yes, a massa. I fear God. So this is what I'm doing. It. I honor God and I want the reward that this is going to produce. Yeah. Submit yourself one to another in the fear of God. Verse 22. Now he get the specific to these rules as it relates to the party in this marriage. So he says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. Yes. Yes. Oh, no, I'm reading that wrong. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands. So this isn't saying submit yourself to your pastor. Did you read that? No. What about your pastor? <laughs> no. So where do you get this foolishness from? So the Bible is very clear. Submit or to be under the leadership of your own husband. This is your covering. As, listen, as unto the Lord. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the what? The wife. Did you see the past there? You didn't see that? No, I'm not being comical. I'm really saying I, I don't see it there. So where did this doctrine come from? So he says, for the husband is the head of the wife, even, even, because it's given a comparison, as Christ is the head of the church. That's right. So that means Christ is saying, if I didn't leave nobody in charge of my church, why are you leaving somebody in charge of your wife? For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he, which is Christ, is the savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything, not just some things. Verse 25, now he's addressing the husbands in this union. He says, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave his life 
for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Verse 27 of Ephesians 5, that he might present it to himself, a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love, he's making a comparison, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife, loveth, listen, loveth who? Loveth himself. So I make this analogy all the time. When spouses get mad and they call each other names. Well, according to what I just read, when you tell your wife she is stupid, what you're really saying is, I'm stupid. <laughs> So the truth is I'm rowing me when I'm rowing her. When she's row, it's vice versa. You, you are one. So when you make such uh, derogatory or, or defaming remarks against your partner, you, it is a clear indicator to me, you don't understand union. Who goes in the mirror, Michael, and says, you big stupid fool. <laughs> for, for, for the exception of those people. Right, right. See, when you understand union, you now bring your language in alignment. Yes. 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 So I'm telling you, the root cause of most marriages that are not achieving the things they want to is that they're not on one accord and their language is polluted. Yes. Every time you're downgrading this woman, every time you're downgrading this man, I mean, you can't be like Lou, my God. You say he love, you say he's kiss up on his wife, you'll never kiss her. Kind of good for nothing, man. You so no good. My Jesus, I should have married Lou. I don't want to. <laughs> Listen what you're saying. You are not on one accord. You are not speaking the same language. Therefore, you have the ingredients for an antagonistic relationship and you will never go forward. Bottom line. So he goes on to say uh, in verse 28, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man, <laughs> I love this piece, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourish it and cherish it, even as the Lord, the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man, watch again, leave his wife and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and the two shall be one flesh. This is interesting because this same uh, thing here is repeated three times in the Bible. It should only show you the importance of it. Verse 32 of Ephesians 5 says, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife, even as himself. And the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now here's the mystery. The mystery he's saying here that if you guys follow the rules as it relates to holy matrimony, meaning that the wife submit to the husband, husband loves his wife as Christ loved the church, sees that as one. The mystery is so much is going to be produced from this relationship almost effortlessly. The struggles that you're having now, and so much what he's saying, if this is ongoing and ongoing, something ain't right here, because we'll all have tr struggles. Right. But if it's ongoing and ongoing, he says something is wrong. And the, the, the core of what is wrong is there is some defect in the unity factor here. Yes. We need to now re-examine the relationship. Where are we falling short in terms of our one voice? Where are we falling short in walking together? That can be the core of it. Why, why are we not getting ahead? Well, if you can't get ahead, if you're always cussing with each other, and you're telling you, you, the minute she make you mad, you run to your controlling ma, who ain't gonna never tell you nothing nice about her. Ah, uh, mommy. Susie's make me so bad. Did, did, didn't I prophesy to you that she was no good? <laughs> <laughs> did I not speak the word of the Lord? <laughs> That's your children problem. You all had too hard. You all think you all know more than your parents. I, God showed me in the spirit she was no good. Glory be to God. <laughs> so watch this now. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. This is so interesting. And we can read from verse 17 to verse 21. Listen to what it says. Again, and whosoever... 
And whatsoever ye do in words or deed, do all in the name of who? The Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. Wise, watch it again. This is Paul again speaking to the church of Colossians. Submit yourselves unto your own husbands. So what is interesting about this is because in the church of Ephesus, he's now reiterating the rules and the laws and the commandments in regard to holy matrimony. So his voice, his, his speech isn't changing. He's sticking with this, this, this is God's order. I only could tell you what God says. So verse 18 says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as it is fit in the Lord. Husband, love your wives and be not, listen, listen, bitter against them. So for him to mention that, see, you gotta read stuff with an understanding. Why would Paul say, love her like Christ loved the church and don't be bitter against her? Well, what I get from that is that for him to mention that, it tells me that the spirit of bitterness is gonna show up one day. So now he's telling me in advance that it can come, but what's I saying? He says, now, in order to overcome this, you've got to love her beyond this conditional thing. So that when she does something that really irates you, your love for her is going to put your foot on the spirit of bitterness. So Paul is it's almost as if he's giving a prophecy. He's saying, listen, I'm telling you, if you follow these rules, even when that spirit come, you will be able to challenge it. So verse 19, he says, husband, love your wives and be not bitter against her. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke, all of these are rules. This is my opinion. He says, father, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. So what he's saying is that, father, in your course of discipline, if you run out, you could get to the point where you provoke this child and this child begin to hate you. So what I'm saying is when these things happen, we shouldn't be shocked. What do we do? Let's go back to the rule book and let's see where we came off track. But we're not taught that way. We beat the child till they're half dead on the floor <laughs> trying to figure stuff out. No, go back to the rule book. Go back to the rule book. So Father provoke not your children, least they... Children to anger, at least they uh, become discouraged. First Peter 6, verse 13. First Peter chapter 6. No, not 6. There's no 6 in First Peter. So that will be... Hold on, let me go back here again. I think I wrote this down wrong. First Peter 5. First Peter chapter 5, I think it is. And let's look at verse 13. You know what, that ain't it either. So we'll pass that, how about that? <laughs> we'll pass that. So anyway, now we're gonna go, we're gonna, bring, we're gonna bring it home right now. All these rules, what is it that we, you're on the home stretch now, need to engage now to, to bring this all together? We heard about the synergy, we heard about the oneness, the one language, the antagonistic relationship, we heard about all of these rules. So what is it, what is it that we need to keep in place? Husband, right? The word husband, 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 is the belt or the band that keeps everything together. That's what it actually means. So what do we do to keep this band around the family? What is it, what is it that we to keep all these components in place? Well, let's look at it. You're gonna see that right now. This is gonna be the governing factor. So the adhesive, of marriage will always be love, bottom line. The adhesive, the word adhesive mean that sticky substance, that what keeps two things together, two or more things together. What is it that's gonna keep all of this intact? Okay, so let's look at some scriptures now. Let's look at 1 Peter uh, chapter four and verse eight. 1 Peter chapter four, verse eight, listen what it says. And above all things have not just regular, but fervent charity, the word charity there means love. Have fervent charity, listen, among yourselves. Why? For charity or love shall cover what? One sin? No, two. No, a multitude of sins. I, uh, I know of a relationship where this lady had cheated on her partner and she was battling whether or not to tell him, right? So she had asked me if I think that 
she should tell him. So I said to her, that's not my call. And let me tell you why. Because some people would disagree with me that. Let me tell you why. You see, I don't know the temperature of her husband. I don't know what homeboy dealing with. I don't know if he's short fuse. Because we had a situation in the Bahamas where there was a neighbor who had called this particular man to tell him that his wife had a man in the apartment next door cheating. And the guy got a cutlass, came home and chopped her to pieces. So I wonder how the neighbor who called, how she feels right now. So I said to her, I said, listen, that's your husband. That's your union. All I can tell you is what the Bible says. And I can give you, I will never tell nobody leave their husband or wife unless it's physical abuse. You separate and try working out. If not, then I guess you take the next step that on you. But I can never tell you, okay, you said you had sex with seven different fellas. Okay. You all have a good day, okay? <laughs> no, no. See, there, that's when you're dealing with counsel, you gotta be wise. You, you cannot be, don't act like you some know it all and you got all the answers. No, no, no. So anyway, she decided to do it. But she prayed about it, she fasted about it. She went and she told him, and of course, he blew a fuse. There was a guy that she was seeing on the job. I think it was like a six month relationship. And, uh, like with most men, and I think this, this makes it much more complicated. It hit a guy, ego, so he will know how much times you did it, where all you did it, blah, blah, blah. And I told her all of this, I said, now if you do tell him this, I mean, let me tell you what to prepare for. Because with men, it's an ego thing, so they're thinking like, what is it about this guy that was better than me? So the first thing a guy is gonna think is sexual. You know, was he bigger than me? Did he do this and do that? And the truth is, he's only bringing torture to himself because you see, men, when it comes to sex, we are very visual. So if she's foolish enough to go into details about her act, this is going to be a stain on his brain. So every time argument comes, you could be arguing about the North Pole. Do you sleep with him for? <laughs> yeah. Or even when he's intimate with you and getting all lovey-dovey and kissy up and all this other stuff, then the devil can come right there and just sprinkle that right in his brain again. Mm, he push you off. Get from around here and touch me. <laughs> and touch that door, touch me. <laughs> 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 what, I'm saying, what I'm saying to you, I know it's comical, but and I'm, again, I'm not telling nobody to be deceitful. Uh, listen what I'm saying. Use wisdom. And who's the wisdom here? The spirit of truth. Who is that? The Holy Spirit. Yes. 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 Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Because I know you want to make it right. You're the same. I, Kevin, I feel guilty. And I agree with you. I'm not fighting you there. But what I'm saying to you, use wisdom. The Holy Spirit may not have you to say it today. Because if you go and do, you don't, you don't know. You don't know what this person is dealing with. And especially if, you, if, they're, you're, you're, if, if you're their world. So... With that said, coming back to the scripture, when it talks about this love, see, genuine love for a person, and the Bible says, cover a multitude of sin. So what happens in a case like this? So the, the, you go towards the sky, you say, listen, I, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but I just want, I just on my conscience, I feel bad, and I'm not making any excuses, it shouldn't have happened, and, and I did this. Well, according to the scripture, the Bible says that a multitude, sorry, love covers a multitude. He's going to be mad. That's a natural behavior. You'll be foolish to think that he would not be upset. And to the point where he probably storm out or don't speak to you for a week or two, whatever the case may be. But if it's genuine love here, he's going to come back. Now, I'm not saying he's going to make up with you, but he's going to wonder why. Why are you doing that? I mean, I, I did this for you. I love you. I showed you this. Now, why, Kevin, why are you taking it this route? Here is why. And it was based on something that was said earlier. A lot of times you get involved with people and you never dealt with the emotional things of what they've been through. And a lot of people are plagued with generational curses. And generational curses are literally forces within that bloodline spiritual that is now imposing its will on this person. So this person comes from a lineage of adulterers, come from a lineage of sexually lustful people. Now they've been fighting it for years. They got married and was able to overcome so far, but they were never delivered from this. Oh so now the husband have to make some business trip or whatever, and this isn't even on her mind. And the neighbor now comes outside, these little short and bow legs and all this other stuff out there. Right? <laughs> right? Right? 
Mind you, she ain't thinking this stuff. But the enemy who she cannot see, like with Eve, and will now begin to influence her. And he have her upper hand because there's a generational curse. She is more vulnerable than this one over here who don't have a generational curse in their life. So my point is, if you didn't break these things, if see people say, okay, no, I ain't gotta break this man. She never cheated on me, no. Uh-uh. Aunts don't leave sugar. You're all crazy. No. You're delusional. You see, because if there's a spirit involved and you are ignorant to it, you are a disadvantage because the, the head of that thing is going to rear up one day. And unfortunately, you won't be prepared to deal with it. It was there all along. It didn't go nowhere. So these are the things you got to look at. And guess what? That's why you have to converse with your partner. You have to talk and be more open. And don't judge them every time they say something you don't like. Well, you know, I used to date Mark, who's a basco. You, what? You used to date Mark? Oh, how long y'all was dating? Well, this was way before you. I don't care. Mark? So right there, she's intimidated to tell you anymore. So you shut this down now. But you can't get but see what you need to do is let them open because there may be some stuff that you need to know that you need to what you should be doing in the conversation is searching for curses, searching for the things you need to go break. That's what you need to rather than trying to trip and, and, and try to address something that was before your time. It's gonna to do with you. So she was supposed to just save herself or until you just pop up somewhere. <laughs> no man, no, people need to get real. So when these things rear their heads. People just go totally out of control and shooting each other and stabbing each other and so on. When the, the truth was, it was there all along. But they always look at stuff from a physical perspective, not looking at it spiritually. And not praying as a man too, you need to break those things. Break it over your wife, break it over your children. Not because you don't physically see it, that means it isn't there. Oh no, it's right there incubating, waiting for the assigned day to bring total division. In, in that relationship. So the Bible says in 1 Peter 4 verse 8, it says above not some things, but all things have fervent love amongst yourselves. So fervent means that's, that's an unconditional love. I'm not loving you because you are in a good position financially. I'm not loving you because you're pretty, because all of these things have a time limit on it. It's not going to be like that forever. So that's telling me if that's why you in this with me, that means that love is only going to last as long as you still look pretty, as long as you making that money. But the day you stop making that paper and the day gravity takes its toll on your facial appearance, I'm out of here. <laughs> so the Bible goes on to say, let's go to uh, 1 Corinthians now, because now that he tells us above all things, make love priority because love is going to bind or bound everything together. So in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 13, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it now breaks down from verse 1 to verse 8. And it says here, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels and have not charity, which is love, I am become as a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understanding and mysteries and all the knowledge, and though I have all the faith so that I could re remove mountains, but have not charity, I am nothing. So it's telling me no matter how educated, no matter how gifted you are, no matter how much of a good preacher, you could prophesy things right down to the nitty gritty. He says, Paul is telling the church of Corinth, all of that means absolutely nothing if you are a loveless person. Verse 3 says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, you're doing all what is right. And though I give my body to be burned, but if I have no charity or love, it profits me absolutely nothing. Verse 4 says, charity suffered long. Now he's telling you now, these are the identifiers of genuine love. Not about a person come and say, well, I, 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 I love you. Yeah, that sounds good. But let's look at what the Bible rules are. Well, he says in verse 4, 1 Corinthians 13, charity or love suffered long, or they're very patient. It is kind. Charity don't envy or it's not jealous. So, so where you know this boot? Where you know him from? It's just my friend from school. School, what, what, what school? From high school, why are you, why are you acting? No, 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 I, I just see him looking at you. Oh, I can't help him from looking at me, what you want me to do? <laughs> Poke his eye out? See, when you're dealing with a, a, a borderline nutcase like that, you need to run. <laughs> yeah. 
my mother have this saying, she says, Kevin, a little can tell you what a lot is gonna be like. And it's the truth. But some of us are so crazy, he's so cute. He cute? You can look cute, stretch off and not cast it too. Yeah, but anyway, he says, charity suffered long and is kind. Charity envied not. Charity vaunted not itself. It is not puff up. It is not arrogant. It is not selfish. These are all the attributes of love. And if you see in someone who claims that they love you, but you're seeing the opposite of this, that is not love. Verse 5 says, the same charity of love does not behave itself unseemly. It seeketh not her own. It's not easily provoked. It is not thinking any evil. Number six, he says, rejoice not in iniquity, but rejoice in the truth. Bearing all things, believe all things, hoping all things, endure all things. Verse eight, charity never faileth. But whether there be prophecies, there shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall all vanish away. So let's drop all the way down to verse 13. Verse 13 says, and now abided faith, hope, charity, these three, but, but, what? The greatest of these is what? Charity or love. So he's saying here now, these, when a person comes to you and says, listen, you can be my husband or you can be my wife and the Lord showed it to me in a dream. This person is mean, they're vindictive and spiteful, they're arrogant, they all puff up, they believe they're the top of everything. Then that way they should tell you that this isn't the person for you because the, the rules are here. If you look at the rules, the rules are crystal clear. We can't run away from it, right? So, John, Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12. We come and we wind it down right now. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 12 makes it abundantly clear again. And what does it say here? It says here, hatred stirred up strife. What? But love do what? Cover all sins. Right? Now, I just gave you in 1 Corinthians 13 all of the uh, evidence of genuine love. All right, and what it's not and what it really is. All right, another litmus test that you could look at. All right, and let's go to First John chapter four, verse twenty. I thought this was so interesting. First John chapter four. We're going to look at verse twenty. Listen to what it says. It says in First John chapter four, verse twenty: If a man say, "I love God," and hated his brother, so your husband saying, "I can't. I hate you." But he's a minister on the pulpit. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, Jesus. This dude who calls you all day in the house. This no good hypocrite who, who just dog you down. But could come on a pulpit and perform or go before people. Come here. My wife, man, I love this woman. My God. It's the best thing since sliced bread right over here. Look at that. And you get home, he call you everything except a child of God. So the Bible says to us, I want you all to really, I, I'm very visual in my speech, so you could really get it. But listen to what the Bible says. If a man say, I love God, but hated his brother. We could put his wife there. We could put anybody there. But how could you hate? In other words, the Bible is saying, how could you say you love me the creator when you hate my creation? How? Liar. If a man say, I love God and hate his brother, he is a who? Liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he could see. How is it humanly possible to love a God who you cannot see? How? No man, don't try that. You're a liar. Now, with that said, we're going to end right here. And what we're going to talk about now to conclude all of this. I gave you all of the rules, and that's what it's all about. The rules as it relates to order in a relationship. I've taken you on the ins and the outs and try to dissect it as much as possible. And I've given you most of what you need to know to be successful. And the, the, the real takeaway here is to be standing as one and to be speaking one language. You shouldn't be talking opposite to what you all agreed to already. That, that's not right. That's not right. And again, when you do those things, then this, that's the only ingredients needed to stagnate to uh, paralyze the uh, growth process of that relationship. And like I would have said, an antagonistic relationship is where you have two people. It isn't that you don't have a union. You have two people involved. However, because they're not on one accord and standing with one another, according to that rule, they would produce less as a team than they were doing as individuals, all right? 
The law of synergy simply is the opposite. Where two or more people will do more as a group, a couple, as a team than they were doing as individual. So what was the pull away, the takeaway? The takeaway is you've got to be careful who you connect with. Yeah. And this isn't just limited to marriage, this is business. Yeah. This, this family, this if certain families, the more I with you, cousin Pookie, a causing problem. I can't get ahead in life, it's gossip all the time. You say, I say, it's time to kick you out of here. Yeah. Still my cousin, but don't come cross here. Yeah. If you need some help and I can help you, I'll help you. But stay there. I will throw the money to you. I will throw whatever you need over there. Just don't come over here. Whenever you come here, something always go wrong, right? Somebody got to shut it down. I can't know the rules and ignore it. I know when you show up, it can be a situation. So I got to get you out of there. So we're going to look at these last. These rules are violation out of the marital covenant. And this is what spells major disaster. We're going to end with this radio. So this part is, is titled Violations. All right? So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is going to be powerful. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And we're going to read from verse 18 to verse 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18 to verse 20. All right? Listen to what it says. Flee what? What does it say? Flee what? Flee what? Don't play like you're only reading that. You all read it. First Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18. What does it say? You all see it just like me. <laughs> chapter 6, verse 18. What does it say? Flee what? Flee fornication. That's what it says. Flee fornication. And what is fornication again? Sexual Uh huh. Outside of marriage, right? So let's be clear here. Fornication means that you're engaging in sexual activities with someone who's not your wife or husband. Right. I won't be clear there because we'll be going with this right now. That definition is very, very much needed. So listen carefully now. He says, flee fornication. But this is the catcher here. Who is he talking to? Is he talking to sinners? No. He's talking to the body of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> he's a body of Christ. Flee fornication. Now he's about to explain it. He says, every sin, all right, that a man do it is without the body. But he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. Now, let me see if I get this straight. You guys are married. You guys are married. So, if one of you decide to step out and engage in fornication, it says you commit sin against your own body. But now that you two have become one, does he indeed mean you individual have committed sin against your body? No. No, no, both parties are going to suffer as a result of this. So if you read it, listen to what it says again. He says here, let me read it, because it may be different in your Bible. So 1 Corinthians 6 verse 18 says, flee, run from it, fornication. Every sin that a man do with is without the body, but he that committed fornication sinned against his own body. The Bible says the two shall become one. Verse 19, What? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are brought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are of God. All right? I can come back here, but let me just give you some more scripture because I will make uh, a lot of sense out of this, right? So let's go to... Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 7 now, next verse, chapter, and we can read from verse 2 to verse 5, all right? Now listen to what he says now, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, beginning at verse 2, nevertheless, to avoid, he's reiterating this, to avoid what? Fornication. Why? He says, now let every man have his what? His own wife, and let every woman have her own husband, all right? Let the husband render unto the wife due benevolence, and likewise also the wife unto her husband. So he's telling you now, don't deprive each other. All of this will be in an effort to derail any even thought process of fornicating with somebody else. Enjoy your partner. Don't sit down and watch porn and want to perform these acts on your partner. He says, no. God is going to encourage you to do what I'm telling you not to do. So he's keep repeating, do not, and I'm, I'm putting emphasis on this because I go into a point. 
So let's go back here again, verse two. Nevertheless, avoid fornication. Let every man have his own wife and let every woman have her own husband. Let the husband render unto the wife